Hello everyone, I'm Alan Fisher. On this episode of AZ Illustrated Science, we take you to the epicenter of a novel approach to treating some of the most severe mental disorders. Also, fighting off common colds and flus becomes harder as we age. We kick off the first of several interviews about inflammation in our health with some emerging research on the aging immune system. But first, here's a look at the day's top stories. The State Senate Appropriations Committee approved a series of budget bills today beginning the legislative budget process. The Senate's proposal is about $150 million less than Governor Jan Brewer asked for earlier this year. The next step for the budget is a vote by the full Senate. In the meantime, leaders in the Arizona House indicate that they will pass an essentially identical budget in the coming days. Once state lawmakers pass a joint budget, leaders from the two chambers will begin negotiations with the governor's office. Governor Brewer must sign the budget bills just like any other proposal. Officials with the governor's office say right now the governor is not inclined to agree with the plans put forward by the legislature. State lawmakers are hoping to finish their work on the spending plan for the upcoming fiscal year so they can adjourn in about six weeks. Tonight, the Tucson City Council is considering annexing more than 160 undeveloped acres near Valencia and Kolb Roads. The area is surrounded by city land. Tucson officials say the goal is to fill in odd spaces on the edge of city limits in order to improve services. Officials from the U.S. Post Office joined a World War II veteran and Arizona Secretary of State Ken Bennett to unveil a new USS Arizona memorial stamp. The unveiling took place this morning at the state's new World War II memorial, which featured the gun barrel from the last USS Arizona. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Epicenter is testing out a new approach to mental health treatment, one that promises better, more lasting results for some of the most severe mental disorders known. In this story, producer Gisela Tellis and photojournalist Bob Lindbergh explain how this approach works. As a child, Nicholas Brightboard watched a family member struggle with schizophrenia and saw firsthand how isolating the illness can be. So when he became a psychologist, he made it his mission to help people with psychotic disorders, which are mental illnesses like schizophrenia that alter a person's sense of reality. We're working with folks who are experiencing maybe auditory or visual hallucinations. They're uh, seeing or hearing things that other people can't see or hear. One of the classic examples could be the person who hears voices, people telling them things, commenting about things around them, maybe even telling them to do things. Um, sometimes folks come in with uh, delusions. These are false beliefs about what's happening in the world. They may worry that people are out to get them or trying to hurt them. They may feel like they're finding special messages and things around them. And, and these symptoms are beginning to get in the way of what they would normally do out in the world with work or with school or with friends. Psychotic illnesses can take a terrible toll. They can cause lifelong problems with cognitive abilities like attention and memory. They're a leading cause of disability worldwide, and their sufferers die an average of 25 years earlier than the general population. But Brightboard thinks all that can be prevented. That's why he founded the Early Psychosis Intervention Center, or Epicenter, in Pima County's Behavioral Health Pavilion. At Epicenter, very broadly, we try and fill in the gaps in treatment for young adults with psychosis. Medication can be very good for reducing some of the symptoms of psychosis, but it, it alone is not sufficient to help people recover. Um, the research very clearly demonstrates it really has a minimal, if any, effect in terms of getting people back to work, in uh, helping people live independently, and in helping people have meaningful lives in the community. Traditionally, treatments for psychotic illnesses focus on controlling symptoms with medication and, if needed, hospitalization. But Epicenter takes a more comprehensive tack. Brightboard's clinic welcomes participants who are 15 to 35 years old and just beginning to show signs of psychosis. If they don't have medical insurance, it provides care for free. And it offers them a voluntary five-year partnership during which they get a range of treatments designed to help them build healthy, productive lives. Really, I tell them, think of it like a menu and pick the things you want to do. 
We have individual therapy. We have group therapy programs. We have a, a family education and support group that meets two times a month. We do individual family sessions. We also do a, an intervention called cognitive remediation. These are uh, activities that you do with a therapist and a clinician that are designed to boost up uh, basic cognitive abilities like memory and attention and problem solving. And we lay these out to these young adults who come to the program and they get to pick and choose what they want. Participants also spend time with peers who can relate to their experiences and eventually become mentors to newer members. One of the hallmarks of these illnesses is a withdrawal from our social relationships here. And, and many of the young adults who experience psychosis do begin to isolate and pull away from you know, people and things that they used to engage with and that used to be sources of support and joy in their lives here. Epicenter is the only center of its kind in Arizona. According to the International Early Psychosis Association, fewer than 20 programs like Epicenter are available across the U.S. Hello. So, okay, so what happened? Dennis Embry heads the Tucson-based Paxis Institute, which identifies and evaluates behavioral prevention programs and works on ways to scale up effective ones. Nevertheless, something happened that is distressed everybody. And so that causes trouble. He says Epicenter okay. isn't just You're unusual, welcome. it's revolutionary. The early psychosis prevention projects, both in this country and in Canada, have a different philosophy, which is really kind of, uh, it's a much overused phrase, treating the whole person, their lives, their interests, their families, helping them scaffold a workable universe for themselves. Epicenter is four years into its five-year run, but it's already seeing signs that its uncommon treatment produces uncommon results. The average person who walks through our door is a 20, 21-year-old male. They are typically unemployed and not in school. They already have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, which is often thought of as the, the most severe of the psychotic disorders. They are abusing drugs at that point right there. They have limited social support, few friends. Um, they come into our program. Uh, after six months of treatment, not only do we get the symptoms of psychosis under control here, but for the average epicenter participant, they have uh, now returned to work or school. They uh, are no longer uh, abusing substances. We, we double the number of close friends they have. I, I like to show that stat to the young adults coming through the door because that's a very meaningful outcome for them. Um, the cognitive skills, the memory, attention, problem solving, uh, we typically get rid of about two-thirds of the deficit within six months there. Um, and, and these folks are beginning to return to the life that they, they had pre-illness here. It is a very dramatic and, and, for a mental illness, fairly quick turnaround. Brightboard is also tracking the other, often unseen, benefits of Epicenter's approach. By keeping the young people he serves employed and well, Brightboard says his clinic is saving the community $4 for every dollar spent on Epicenter, which is funded through research grants and the University of Arizona. Now Brightboard is raising funds to open an Epicenter in Phoenix. He's hoping the program's model of early intervention will spread. We see much attention in medicine about the preventative strategies for diabetes, for heart attacks, for cancer. Things that we can be doing now to reduce the likelihood that these things will happen. That, that approach is, is still uh, typically absent within the field of psychiatry. But just like we can do things preventively to reduce other biological illnesses like heart disease or diabetes, there are things that we can be doing to uh, prevent the biological illnesses that uh, we think of as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder here. Embry would also like to see Epicenter's approach become the rule and not the exception. Only then, he says, can society fulfill all its potential. If we don't have centers like the Epicenter, we will waste lives. You know, it's like putting people in the garbage can and taking them to the dump. I'm sorry, that's not acceptable to me. So here we have this tool that saves us lots of money, gives people freedom to be a productive citizen, to have loving and happy relationships. Why would we not do that? That's the right thing to do.
I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, the latest on the missing Malaysian jetliner and Ukraine's uncertain future. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Steve Inskeep began a road trip tracing the U.S.-Mexico border starting at the mouth of the Rio Grande. So here it is. We're going to follow the course of this river. At some point around El Paso, Texas, we'll strike out across the desert and continue following the border to the west all the way to Tijuana. It's more than 1,900 miles from here as the border goes. A journey through the borderland on the next morning edition from NPR News. As we age, our bodies have a harder time fighting off infections. In a study published in the Journal of Immunology, a local research team has found a key to understanding why that is. Yanko Nikolic Zugic, the chair of the University of Arizona Department of Immunobiology and co-director of the Center on Aging, is here to tell us more. Yanko, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Alan, for having me. What happens to our bodies and our immune systems as we age, Yanko? So the immune system is a highly connected immune system, uh, system. It has a lot of different cells that need to communicate to one another, that need to detect the bugs as they infect us. And uh, it's, it's a very precise and fine-tuned machinery. As we grow old, different facets of that process all go awry a little bit. Not in everybody, not all at the same time, but eventually as we grow older and older, many of these pieces don't communicate to one another very well. They don't detect the bug very well. And one of the greatest challenges for immunologists is to really understand how many defects are there and which defects are the most important. In a way, the analogy that I would make is, you know, you've got a road and there are potholes and some potholes are huge and others are small. You want to figure out which potholes are the most important, which ones are the ones that you need to fill. There is another important analogy with that, and that is that some of these defects, even though very small in the beginning, if they're happening along the same pathway where the cells need to communicate with one another, will augment each other so that a defect that doesn't seem very pronounced at the beginning now gets to be very large and very substantial so that our ability to deal particularly with new infection that we have never seen before, you know, like SARS showed up several years ago, it was very deadly to older people. Monkeypox showed up, it was also deadly to older people. West Nile virus, very deadly to older people. You know, all of these little defects can combine to result in a major vulnerability of the older population. And Yanko, when people reach a certain age, will everyone expect to see this situation or is this limited to certain numbers of people? No, and that is actually one part of, uh, I think, an interesting and important discovery that we have made relatively recently. There are some people whose immune systems look very nice and very robust and very good, and that might continue well into their 80s. There are other people whose immune systems don't look quite as good. And uh, then the question is to understand where and how we can intervene the best to fix that immune system and to make sure that infectious diseases are not a problem for our older adult population. Yanka, what are T cells and what role do they play in all this? T cells are one kind of our white blood cells and they are in charge of dealing with infection in a very specific manner. Some of the T cells, the ones that I study a lot, called CD8 T cells, are in charge of dealing with viruses, bacteria, that, and, and, and parasites that hide inside the cell. They are perfectly equipped to um, essentially zap that infection and cure us from the infections that try to camouflage themselves by invading our own cells and dividing inside our own cells. They are the part of the immune system that is undoubtedly the most affected by the process of aging, and that is part of the reason why we study them. Uh, their numbers go down, particularly of the CD8 cells, as we grow old. Their function also goes down. Their ability to move around the body in a coordinated manner is also impaired. And so a lot of what we're trying to do, again, is you know, how to detect that. So if we look, as you said, some people will not experience this as a problem. If we take our older adult population, can we stratify them? Can we figure out which ones are likely to experience those problems? And for those that are, what is the best way to try to fix it? And Yanko, you published recently. Um, could you tell us, please, a little bit about your recent research? 
So what we have explored there is exactly what I'm talking about. So how can we predict who's going to be reacting worse and who's going to be reacting better? And how can we better understand particularly human immune aging and human T-cell aging? And we have discovered that the virus, that there is a virus that many of us carry. We actually tend to carry some viruses with us, not like the flu virus, which infects us and our immune system reacts against it and we kick out the virus you know, uh, in most of the cases, the virus is gone in a few weeks. There are viruses, unfortunately, that we do not kick out. Herpes viruses are a whole group of viruses that are very well adapted to infect us and then to stay, to hide inside our cells and, not, and our immune system cannot kick them out. Cytomegalovirus or CMV is one such virus and it's very prevalent. About 60 to 70 percent of our population has it and as we grow older even larger proportions of the people have it. And around the world there are nations where 90 percent or even 100 percent of the people will be infected with this virus. This virus has, uh, is, is a master stealth um, you know, manipulator of the immune system. It, reactivates a little bit in different parts of our body. The immune system goes and beats it back and then the virus goes dormant and hides again only to come up somewhere else. That is sort of like a dance between the virus and the immune system and we were fascinated by it because that dance obviously goes throughout our aging. Uh, there are connections with cytomegalovirus or CMV and some bad outcomes like you know you can, you're, you can expect to have more uh, heart disease and, 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 and blood vessel disease if you have CMV and there are other adverse things that, that this virus does. And we've discovered that our immune system ages completely differently if you have CMV as opposed to when you don't. And those are now, this is now giving us markers that, that will allow us to fix the immune system differently whether you have CMV or not. There are also people that are very good at controlling their CMV with relatively low resources, but in many people, CMV just occupies the attention of the immune system so that this immune system is no longer able to deal with some other infections. So are, th are there ways to protect the more elderly people from these long-lasting uh, diseases that are under the surface then? Well, we're working on that very hard, but I think that, you know, uh, if we can understand why some people can protect themselves very well or use only a little bit of their immune system to deal with CMV and others don't, I think this will hold the key. More importantly, as we think about, you know, getting the, 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 the immune system that is, that is a less robust, now we know that in some cases we can actually try to generate new vaccines to try to, to improve and boost the immune system and the reactivity of the immune system to the vaccine because it's the immune system that will see the vaccine and then be able to defend us against real infection down the line. And then in those, there are also cases where we just don't have enough T cells to deal with this. And in that case, we must actually try to do something else, which is to rejuvenate the immune system, to go to the factories that produce T cells and that have died down or have winded down their production when we were young and try to reawaken them. So this is a very fascinating area of rejuvenation of the immune system that we also work on and that this research is going to enable us to do better and in a more targeted fashion. And you mentioned the rejuvenation of the immune system. Where do we stand in that? Is that something that we'll be able to uh, see in a year, 10 years, five years, 20 years? Do you have any feel for that, Yanko? Uh, my, my, my bet would be 10 years, five to 10 years, because I think that, uh, you know, there, there's already a lot of published, a lot of understanding, a lot of knowledge. It's not as simple as we thought in the beginning. We thought that there will be some magic bullets that we can use, like a single drug that will rejuvenate the whole of the immune system. If we go back to the beginning of our conversation when I told you that there are many defects, there are also many defects in terms of making new T cells. And so we need to understand those defects. There's at least three right now that we know and that we're working on delineating and we need to fix each one of them separately, put it together, and then we should have the rejuvenation. But I do not believe that it's going to be more than 10 years before we're able to do that. And Yanka, when, when someone's immune system is, is compromised at, at, when they become elderly, are vaccines such as flu vaccines less effective and what can be done about that? They're very much less effective. So again, uh, the efficacy of the flu vaccine in the population over 65 is only between 17 and 51 percent. Now, the most important thing is that this doesn't mean that people should not take that vaccine. Everybody should take the vaccine because it provides at least some protection. But that protection is much worse than it was when we were younger. 
The research that we have done now should actually allow us to go to the next phase and do the predictions and figure out based on the profile, based on the CMV status, based on the T cell status, we should be able to predict which people will react well to the vaccine as it is now. They should get the existing vaccine. People that are not likely to react need to get different vaccines. There is this high dose flu vaccine. It's not the greatest invention around. We simply give people four times as much of the flu vaccine as we did in the past. But we now have a much, much better way to, to or ways to, to improve the vaccine by juicing up the vaccine itself so that it would essentially provide a giddy up for the T cells that are around. And so a whole section of our population should get a modified vaccine that we're working on. It doesn't still exist on the market, but there's a lot of research, including in our own lab, and at the Center on Aging that we're doing to, to get it there. And then there will be some people that will be unlikely to respond to the vaccine, no matter how good the vaccine is, because they simply don't have the cells. And that is where rejuvenation is really going to be the key issue. That is where we need to go and try to get the factories to make new T cells and B cells and other components of the immune system that we might need. And Yanka, we have about 30 seconds left. Uh, as people live longer, we have more aged people. Is this going to be sort of like a medical crisis? It will be if we don't do something different. We have wonderful interventions in animals that prolong not only the lifespan, but also the health span. And we need to really explore that very much because right now as a nation, we're not investing enough in that research. That's the only thing long-term that's going to help us. In the meantime, there's a lot of better models of care that we can implement, but it's going to be more or less a series of band-aids. Well, Yanko, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Alan. It was a pleasure to be here. Someday in the not-too-distant future, people could use their smartphones to cast a ballot. According to a new study published in the journal Human Factors, smartphone voting systems could even lead to fewer user errors. Here to tell us more about that study and to describe what voting may look like in the future is Arizona Public Media Technology contributor Jason Catterhenry, who has been following this story in the news and on the web. Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to be here. Jason, tell us a little bit about the study and the results, if you would, please. Sure. Uh, so there are now a lot of ways people vote electronically with machines at a polling place, um, but they've noticed issues with speed of voting and accuracy of voting because people are unfamiliar with how these systems look. So this group developed a smartphone app that allowed people to vote, and by using an interface that people were familiar with, uh, people who owned smartphones were able to vote much faster and much more effectively than using a traditional electronic balloting machine. And Jason, what about the people who didn't have smartphones and weren't familiar with them? Uh, the people who were not familiar with smartphones voted just as poorly as they would have on an electronic voting machine. And is this technology seen as, as a way to get better voter turnout then, or is it the opposite? Uh, I think this is really seen as a way to optimize electronic voting. Um, whether or not people are using a smartphone or a device at a polling station, if you're familiar with the interface, you're going to spend less time trying to figure it out and more time trying to actually cast your ballot. Um, Humans are very good at recognizing patterns, and so even if voting isn't done on a smartphone, if the interface is familiar to people, it will make it much more efficient. What are some of the challenges or drawbacks to this sort of system, of this sort of voting system? Well, voting on a smartphone would require transport of data over probably the public internet. Um, and much like you're concerned with security about shopping, security in an election is a much higher priority. Um, with the recent breaches we've seen of credit card data, I mean, life goes on at those companies, but in an election, if you were able to effectively steal an election, you've got a much bigger problem until the next election occurs. And as far as that goes, in, in terms of the security, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, avoiding fraud and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. what could be done to, to uh, do away with that challenge? Well, uh, on the face of it, paper voting offers a lot of advantages over electronic voting, uh, simply in the, the amount of effort required in order to get enough votes to change an election. Uh, even if you wanted to do it with paper ballots, you need to either get enough people to change votes, which means that someone's probably going to leak that information, or one person will have to put in so much effort it's going to get noticed by somebody. Um, with electronic voting, you only, only, all you need to do is either hack smartphones to get credentials or hack the central system. and it's a much higher payoff if you manage to do that successfully. So for example, someone who is very skilled at this could vote for me and for all of my friends. 
yes. Uh, they may not be able to hack the central system, but if you're using just your smartphone or your computer, if they manage to send you an email with a virus and get several people to install that, they may be able to steal your credentials and without you even knowing it, vote on your behalf. Okay, and you mentioned paper voting as being more difficult to uh, end up with a fraudulent vote. I mean, we've seen situations historically where, where that has been the case, where, where even presidential races have had questionable outcomes. Um, do you think that it's easier to cheat with an electronic system than a paper system? Yeah, it's much easier to cheat simply because of the, once again, the scale of the process. Uh, one of the problems that in past elections you've seen with paper voting is ballots get lost or misplaced or they're sort of hard to use. Uh, and they're actually researchers coming up with ways to use paper and electronic uh, in tandem to offer sort of the benefits of both with uh, none of the problems. Uh, there's a voting system right now that a researcher has come up with where you essentially vote on a piece of paper uh, and then you shred the list of candidates next to it and you scan in just your selections. Uh, and using uh, some very complex encryption, you're, you can take your receipt from your voting booth and actually verify online that your vote was counted properly, which is something that you can't do even with electronic systems today. Locally in Pima County in the city of Tucson, we use a system where you actually look at a candidate's name or a proposition and fill in the bubble. Mm -hmm. um, does that seem more clear than, than what we're seeing on, on the, uh, on the uh, phone app? I think so, because uh, people are sort of used to that. Uh, once again, with familiarity, uh, if you look at a piece of paper and there's a bubble to fill in rather than perhaps a punch card or some other thing like that, if you could take the, the ease of which it is to fill in a bubble, and almost everyone in America has filled in bubbles for tests for years, so this is sort of a, a process we're all familiar with, uh, and you add that sort of the encryption level so that there is a way to verify that paper ballot once it goes into the machine, I think you sort of have the best of both worlds. Okay. And um, what are some technologies that could be implemented to make this type of electronic voting safer? Well, you could have secure systems. So right now, um, like on your computer, you can install any operating system you want. Um, and it might be possible in the future for you to download what is essentially a, a virtual computer on that that has a high level of encryption. So even if someone were to hack your computer, they wouldn't be able to get your credentials because you're using a, a sort of a subsystem inside there. Um, that sort of bonus encryption on both ends might ev eventually lead to proper electronic voting someday. Okay, and one important tenet in voting in the United States is confidentiality. Nobody knows how you voted. How does that line out in the, we got about 30 seconds left. How does that line out uh, with the electronic style of voting, Jason? Uh, there's actually a, a process called a, a mix encryption, and you can actually take ballots in and using a verifiable process and get out full tallies without being able to trace who voted for what. Um, and this is sort of a well understood and it's a very complex set of math, but um, you, can, you can have some votes that end up coming out the other end and you can verify they're correct but not know who voted for what. Well, Jason, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. That's our show. To keep up with the latest news and watch the segments from this and other editions of AZ Illustrated, go to our website, news.azpm.org. I'm Alan Fisher. Thanks for watching.